All right. Well, I will um, get us started. For anyone who I haven't met, my name is Sarah Andre. I'm with Common Cause um, National Redistricting Team. Um, and we will be talking about now how technology and data can improve public engagement and fair representation in 2030. Um, I'm going to ask all of our panelists first to very briefly give us your name, um, where you're based, and your organization. Hi, I'm Kate Donovan. I am based in Rochester, New York, and I'm here with the Redistricting Data Hub. Mike, yes, amazing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Moon Duchin. I'm a professor of mathematics at Tufts University, which is in the Boston area. And um, I run a lab that did lots of redistricting work in this cycle. Hi, my name is Andrew Strong, and I am not a data person at all. Um, I'm based in San Diego, California, and I am the director of the Office of Equity and Racial Justice in the county. All right, I'm going to kick us off with a question we've been asking all of our panelists. What gives you hope for fair representation next census and redistricting cycle in 2030? And I will start with you, Andrew, our, our non-data person. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> ah, see, I think they're going to regret bringing me to this panel now. Um, I have to keep it real when it comes to this question. Um, you know, it's it, in the words of John Powell, who, if anybody knows who that is, that's the director of the Other Marine Belonging Institute out of UC Berkeley. There's a lot of breaking in this country, right? When you're talking about people and individuals and what's at your core beliefs of who you are. And as we start to talk about redistricting, we talk, we talk about these commissions, any commission you're talking about bringing, bringing folks to, you talk, talk about politics, you talk about elections, you know, we can't deny all that stuff plays, plays a part, right? We can bring us a, a, an inclusive group of community folks into a room and you're gonna have breaking among those community folks, right? We can bring those BIPOC folks into the room, you have breaking among those folks. So what I think gives me hope when we talk about 2030 is this opportunity to build in, you know, how do we create belonging, right? How do we make sure people are at the table, they feel heard, but also we're giving them tools to actually learn how to talk to, talk to each other to understand each other before we actually walk into the room and start having these map conversations, right? About our districts. But also um, what gives me hope for 2030 is the fact that there's change all across the country when you're talking about elections, right? And you're talking about politics, but unfortunately you have change going in, in both ways, right? Um, so when you think about hope, um, you know, I think there's hope, but at the same time, there's a struggle and we gotta think about the breaking that's happening in this country and what we're gonna do about it as we go through these processes. Ben? Okay, so uh, to answer that question, let me start by saying just a little bit more about what I have been involved with uh, in the last few years. So I was a strange individual who wore many hats in the last few years in redistricting. Um, I did a, a lot of advising and consulting with commissions and other redistricting bodies. So I met many of you on Zoom um, in that way. Um, I also served as an expert in redistricting litigation in seven states, plus Boston City Council. What a mess. Um, and, um, and then finally was a technologist, which is was part of what we're addressing directly on this panel. So my, my lab um, created uh, mapping software called Districter that uh, was used in 140 localities around the country. We partnered with a number of today's sponsors to sort of bring that tool to lots of places. And it was very gratifying to, to watch it be used so that people could map their communities, map their districts, and kind of make their voice heard in a data register um, when it came to the, the redistricting process. So that's that's a little bit of, of backdrop. Actually, I was looking at this report the common cause put together and I realized I was involved in states earning every grade on this table, right? <laughs> Which is maybe a sign of a little too much. <laughs> um, so what, what, what makes me optimistic is actually not to be cheesy, but convenings like this because the kind of information sharing that I just heard happening today means that um, next time around, there won't be as much of a sensation of starting from scratch. There's a lot to be shared in terms of um, who can be brought in to help coordinate, uh, what good process looks like, and especially close to my heart, uh, how technology 
can help and not just be the threat that we're all trying to negate, but also can help us do a better job of listening to communities, of, of, of making good on that promise of respecting communities of interest. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll echo uh, everything that both my fellow panelists have said, but also add um, when I talk to folks who this isn't their first rodeo, uh, the, the level of public engagement um, was just really something new. And I so I think the more that we hear people talking about redistricting and also the more that we hear the media talking about the rules of the game and how that affects the representation that we get, um, that really hits home for people. Um, I uh, was a political scientist before I joined the redistricting data hub um, and studied public opinion. And I will tell you that there's still a lot of people that don't know what redistricting is out there. But uh, among those that do, it is actually one of the few probably remaining bipartisan issues. I think Katie Wright was actually touching on this earlier very eloquently, um, that when you talk to people, like nobody likes politicians serving themselves. Uh, nobody likes legislatures thinking first and foremost of themselves and, and not the people that they're there to, you know, to represent. So um, I think that that gives me a lot of hope plus, um, you know, states are laboratories for democracy. And we've seen this with a number of other issues that when some states adopt something new and other states can look and see like, hey, uh, they're still alive, their state didn't blow up. Uh, maybe we could do that here too. So I think there is, um, you know, increasing momentum uh, and, and potentially sort of a tipping point with uh, states, you know, being willing to, pass the torch to a, a better system in terms of who's drawing the line, so. Hey, our next question, um, can you share a story of how technology or data was used creativ creatively to solve a public problem that could be related to redistricting or, or anything in the course of your career? And Andrew, I'll start with you again. All right, well, um, I think I'll start with, um, I'll give a couple of examples, I think, um, briefly, but one, I know people might be tired of hearing about this, but COVID taught us a lot, right? It taught us a lot. Before this role as a director of equity racial justice, I was chief of staff to our chief administrative officer at the county. And during COVID-19, we we're all at the emergency operations center, right? We're trying to figure out how to how to get immunizations out there, how to set up immunization station, like why why aren't certain folks getting immunized, right? And and when we got the healthy places index from the state of California, right, as a as a tool to be able to say, okay this is where we can actually start to overlay to say, where, where do we wanna put these sites, right? Um, it was helpful, but then it also told us who weren't actually going to get those immunizations, right? So it led us to think creatively about how do we actually start to jump into those communities? What is that, who do we need to talk to? What types of contracts do we need to now start awarding based on race and place, right? That, that could potentially violate Prop 209, right? But how do we navigate those waters? But, but start to do those contracts, right, that are specifically targeted um, for our specific communities, our BIPOC communities, our underserved communities, and thinking about how do we give money to nonprofits who, who are trusted messengers in those communities to be able to get folks to come get those immunizations. And all that started with the Healthy Places Index that clearly showed us, right, the data of where we needed to target. And then just another quick example of how that kind of translates into after COVID is after COVID-19, we started to say, okay, now we can actually use some of these data these, these maps and levels of analysis that have race in place for different things and not just healthcare, things like housing, right? Where do we need to, where do we want to place some of our new housing, some of our new housing developments based on not just the need that there's no housing there, but there may be a community that needs specific services, right? There may be a homeless population that we know needs specific services out in Hakumba, right? That's out in the desert. Right, that needs specific services. So what does that look like? Well, now we can create a housing project, right? A housing infrastructure that's close to transit that, that can also have services that we can provide those folks in those communities. So, so I mean, the Healthy Places Index has, has led to a lot in our, our county. Okay, um, here's a story. Um, I'll be brief, but I found this story to be pretty meaningful in my experience. So this wasn't one of the big high profile, you know, like, Milligan, Alabama lawsuit cases. This was something very small. Um, I was, maybe some of the folks in this room uh, know Sekou Franklin. He's a, a political scientist uh, at Middle Tennessee. 
And um, he reached out to, to my lab and said, can you help with a small mapping job? It's Jackson, Tennessee. It's a, a fairly small city kind of around the center. Um, and put us in touch with a city councilor who was really frustrated. The reason that city councilor was frustrated is that the city had contracted with a mapping firm to do the redistricting. It's a nine seat city council. It's about a half and half um, white and people of color split. Um, and um, the consultant was saying there can only be um, three districts controlled by minority preferences with opportunity to elect three out of nine, because that's just the way the census data is. It's just where people live. It's a very difficult problem, you know, redistricting, and it just has to be this way. Uh, sorry, my computer says so. And actually, he's quoted in the, actually, you could look this up and I'll share this with you. I think it's such an amazing story. He's quoted in the paper saying the, the data did it, not me. Right. And and this this one city councilor was like, I something doesn't smell right. Uh, can you uh, draw a map that would show that it's possible to have four districts that are controlled by uh, the preferences of people of color, most likely? And so I, I said, sure, we even have a tool where you could do it yourself. And I said, no, you do it. OK, so we sat down and one of one of my employees at the time drew within an hour a map with four um, minority controlled districts and a map with five just to show that you could do it right <laughs> and then um, we were asked to come in and address the city council so we hop on zoom my colleague Chanel Richardson and I we, we go to a, a meeting and in this meeting we presented you know very kind of formally we called these plans plan a and plan b and we showed their stats and we told the story and then to, to our enormous surprise um, the counselor said excuse me but um which do you like better plan A or plan B. And we were like, what? These are just demonstration maps. I don't know, plan A? And they unanimously adopted it on the spot. <laughs> it's the new map in Jackson, Tennessee, right? Um, to me, this was an extraordinary story, right? This was an extraordinary story of a technology gap and of a bad faith consultant, <laughs> right? Um, and a gap that's so easy to close, right? Um, and so I don't think the sol solution, you know, I think th there's several kinds of solutions, but to me, this is a story, uh, I don't know if it's creative or not, uh, but it's a story of sort of technology making it possible to democratize democracy, if that's a thing, right? Um, and, and sort of uh, pull back some like wool over the eyes, because what happened was, you know, the city council, we, and we, then we were flooded with emails over the next week thanking us, uh, which we were like, it was a strange experience, um, right? Um, but I, I think that uh, the getting the tools out there, but also getting people who are confident enough to use the tools, right, out there. Um, one of my missions as an educator in this space is also to like train up an army um, for for all the all the things that are needed in all these states because redistricting happens at scales large and small. Uh, this is a not so shameless plug because I was not one of the people who came up with this idea or found the funding for this idea or did all the hard work to make it happen, but just joined when the redistricting data hub came into existence. Um, and I do think it's a really nice example of a solution to a difficult problem. I know there's a lot of folks in here from local redistricting commissions. I'm sorry, we see you, we want to support you. It's difficult, uh, but we, we haven't forgotten you. And if we can figure out a way uh, to do it at scale, we will do it. But, um, you know, essentially a lot of the folks coming out of the 2011 cycle were talking to one another and saying, you know, what, what do we want to do next time? What do we want to do better? Exactly what we're doing here today. And uh, data and data accessibility and having good documentation for the data um, came up. Uh, you all know that it's an incredibly data intensive process and some of the data sets are just ludicrously difficult to collect. Uh, even if you've got it, you need a lot of skill to process it and clean it up and put it in a usable form. Um, and so just this notion of being able to go to a central repository, I mean, sort of like the statewide database for California, right? That's what RDH tries to be on sort of a national level. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've, um, 
really demonstrated the value of having that sort of central repository where you can get quality data that's documented for free. Um, I'm proud of our data team. When we get requests for data that we don't have, we will try our best and we create custom data sets sometimes, or we'll go out and, and hunt data down uh, that is useful for folks. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, there's always more we can be, can be doing, but I think um, it's a nice example of that. Um, Moon, you brought up uh, something that we had talked about in one of the breakout rooms earlier, which was about um, basically like the, the talent pipeline and the uh, availability of um, contractors and consultants and, and whatnot to help in this space. Um, curious for you and for any of our panelists, um, what kinds of um, tips or ideas do you have in mind looking ahead to 2030, how we can ensure that um, we maintain a talent pool of folks who are able to work with GIS data, who are able to draw maps that include more uh, minority majority districts um, who have that know-how, how to manipulate this um, data, work with data sets and um, who have that GIS expertise. Well, just one thing I would bring up is um, the role of academia, which is kind of interesting. When I've been talking to folks all day about how commissions and other redistricting bodies went about putting together their team, their sort of support team. Um, and I think of there as being three kind of places, types of places you can go to for support. There's, there's academia, um, but one of the problems is that academics kind of get thought, oh, well, today we arrived and we were told we were advocates, right? <laughs> and so I think uh, academics kind of get thought of, I think broadly as, somehow democratic or liberal because universities um, and that can sort of create a perception problem for academics. Um, a second bucket of expertise would be in think tanks like people have, have uh, mentioned the work of the Brennan Center, which is an example of a think tank doing uh, really great work in this space. But then there's a third category of, of commercial consultants, right? And what I saw was a lot of um, commissions and other bodies going to commercial consultants. Um, and I'd like to have us kind of all think broadly about ways to counter that impulse. And it's not to say that commercial consultants are always bad. Um, there are commercial consultants doing really great work, but also it is a choice. It's not neutral just because um, commercial, <laughs> right? Um, and so just thinking about the ways that these three kind of arenas can interact is gonna be really important for the future work of commissions. To the talent pipeline, I think it's pretty clear that, that universities and, and various kinds of training programs that go through universities are a great source of people. So also talking to, you know, there's, there's uh, I can think of three or four academic hubs around the country, and please talk to me about, about any of this. I'd love to, to talk to folks a little bit more about building up this pipeline, but my lab is far from the only place that's doing this, but you know, I probably um, just, our lab has had summer programs with uh, 35 students, 52 students, uh, it was a, a paltry 12 this past summer, but, but these are people getting rigorous introduction to all of these ways of thinking and all the GIS and all the tools and that are looking for ways to, to be involved. I, I would sort of put a little plug as a math person, as a STEM person, there's so much appetite to be relevant that we're not getting in our day jobs. I mean, that's my own story of, of how I got into redistricting in 2016 from a background of thinking about random walks on donut spaces um, to, to suddenly sort of finding a way to kind of be in the conversation about, about democracy. That was extremely invigorating. And with the blessings of tenure, I was able to affect a kind of career transition in that direction, right? Um, so, so all to say, um, there's actually a huge number of quantitative people who are leaving college and looking for ways to make the country and the world a little bit better. And if you partner with the right kinds of academic groups, that gives you enormous access to, to talented folks who have a drive to make things better. Um, so it's a thought about that. Uh -huh. I'll just, just chime in real quick because all really, really good points. Um, just, a, just a point about um, community and giving community kind of the bandwidth 
to be able to look at this data on these commissions. Um, one of the things, our initiative through our office that was actually board directed from one of our um, supervisors is a data equity access for, for our community, right? And that's thinking through how do you provide training resources for folks who are able, willing, and want to participate and understand how to use these data tools that we're putting out there, right? The county has a, has a data portal, right? We, we just developed equity, equity indicators for our region, and we're about to release that report hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But we want, we want our community to be able to not just look at that report. We want them to be able to go in and take a look and zoom in on a map and say, oh, wow, this, we, need, we, we need some community space in this area. There's all this community space here. Let's go down to the board and advocate for parks in this region because we can see it here. And the county says it's there, right? So we want to give them the tools to be able to do that. And as a part of the process, we have these regional leadership academies in the county where we basically recruit community folks to come in and be civically engaged and learn about the county community um, the government, what it means, all these different things. But a part of those academies will, will now be a, a couple of uh, classes on data and how to use our data portal, how to use the maps and GIS tools right, at, a, at a fundamental level and then open it up to, to whether they want to engage at a deeper level to learn more about that. So That is awesome. Kate, any thoughts on, on a talent pool and, and whatnot? Um, just one, I guess, two uh, small comments to add is that, uh, you know, it's, I don't, I guess we just call this the mid-decade period, right? Like, I don't really know when the cycle officially ended um, or if it did at all. Um, and so I guess if you're looking for silver linings to all of this redistricting continue to happen, it's that there, it continues to be in people's minds and it continues to provide opportunities for people to get engaged. So it's not like there's nothing happening and we're all just waiting until 2030 and, you know, a year or two before we're going to have to uh, you know, get it together and figure out like who who is going to do all this work as we as we ramp up. Um, and I think you know, I was thinking just about um, what you were saying, Moon, about you know that there's a lot of young people graduating in these technical fields and they want to make a difference in the world and. You know, as a former professor, I spent a lot of time talking to panicking seniors about what they were going to do with their lives. Um, and one of the things I would tell them is that like half the battle is just figuring out what your options are. Like you go through school and they're like, do you want to be a pilot or a lawyer or a teacher or, you know, and there's like sort of these like stereotypical positions that are out there. And so like even knowing that like, oh, I could work on mapping, like I could be, you know, somebody who's analyzing election results and trying to support the Voting Rights Act. Like, I think that's something that's a communication gap that we still have of um, letting folks know that this is an option out there. I, um, Rebecca Theobald at the University of Colorado Boulder is uh, an evangelist for this, I think, in, in geography. So, um, oh, or Colorado State. Yeah, she's in Colorado. Uh, and um, there we go. So we just, we need more of her, right? We need more folks like her talking to these people who do want to get involved and do have the skills to do it and just don't know that it's an option. Next question for you guys. Um, what are some of the civic challenges that you've observed over the course of your career um, that could benefit that could benefit from innovative technology or data? And I'll start with you again, Andrew. <laughs> you picked on um, <laughs> civic challenges. There's so many. Um, I think. Um, so one of the one of the projects that's in our office is a social equity program for commercial cannabis, and the county had, doesn't have a, com, a commercial cannabis ordinance. They're about to launch one, um, and they want to layer the social equity program on top of it. And what that is is addressing the war, addressing the um, harms that were done by the war on drugs and the overcriminalization of marijuana on our black and brown and underserved communities, right? And providing a level of access to to folks who've been impacted by that, right? To participate in the legal cannabis industry, but to also um, address harms that were done to the community, so the folks in those communities. And some of the civic and the legal challenges is what, what, what you, I think of when you raise that question, the things like Proposition 209, right, in the state of California that, that prevents you from discriminating in all these things and saying, are oh, we going to target specific communities based on race, place? Um, and I think a lot of these, a lot of the issues and a lot of the walls that come up when you talk about Prop 209 um, could could be mitigated for or even addressed if you think about how to use proxies for race, right? How to use different proxies 
for these different categories, right? Because we know that the communities that we're trying to, to, to support and address the harms that were done are the same communities who have low economic um, you know, wealth within their region, in their community. They have low birth weight among their babies, right? They have um, the food deserts in their communities. They have, they're being over-policed. They have the most arrest rates. You can put together proxies, right? Enough data to come up with some type of index, right? To say, these are the communities you wanna address. And I think a lot of the issues that we see in the state of California, um, trying to address and, and help, help our most impacted communities um, come from and stem from Proposition 209, but there's ways you could be very creative about how you really address and tackle those issues. Well, I'll mention something that I've heard many times mentioned today um, when it comes to community mapping. And that's the question or, or the observation. We did something right this time and we got so much input, but we got so much input, we didn't know what to do with it, right? That I heard that a form of that observation many times today. Um, and so to that, I wanted to just, to, that's a challenge. Um, and, and thinking about how to weigh um, different kinds of, of submissions to, um, or, or sort of comments at a public hearing or submissions to a public portal, how to fuse them, how to weigh them, how to summarize them, how to describe them, how to pull apart AstroTurf from genuine uh, testimony, whatever that means. Right. Um, all of these are, are, are challenges. And so I just want to mention, I don't think this is a conclusively solvable problem, it, you know, uh, but that was something that I and my colleagues have worked on very much over the last few years and are continuing to work on is the question of aggregation once you've pulled all of these um, comments and submissions together. And so I'll mention, for instance, that in Michigan, um, so we were brought in there by the Department of State to collect public input and did that, set up a portal, people could submit comments and, and say things about, uh, map a community and talk about why it's important. And then people could comment on each other's submissions and okay, great. Um, so now we got, we got 1500, I think it was 1500 community of interest submissions, people drawing something and saying, this is my community, take us seriously. Okay, what do you do? Um, and so what we did in my lab was we spent an unthinkable number of person hours uh, trying to synthesize that and we, we at first we were like well just data science it you know <laughs> somehow and then uh this turned out to be challenging um but ultimately we were able through some methods that have now been published in in you know peer-reviewed venues we were able to synthesize that down into 34 clusters where there was some geographical coherence in the maps people were submitting and what they had to say could be summarized um, and so we used a combination of, of geometry and natural language processing, whatever we did, we created this stuff. And then we made up some heat maps and gave them back to the commission. And actually I was really delighted to hear from Anthony today that it did not go unheated or at least not entirely <laughs> because Anthony used it <laughs> when um, drawing congressional lines, but it was a little bit hard to see at the end of the day and on the insane timeline of the work that you all know, the work of a commission is always under insane time pressure. It was a little hard to see at the time how to take that synthesis and that advice about how to use it and see it all the way through to utility, if you see what I mean. Um, and so for me on the technological side, there were a lot of lessons learned about that. And I have some pretty strong ideas about improving the process for next time around. Um, and so just to say, I think this is an area where there's, there's an ultimately unsolvable problem. You don't solve it once and for all. You just keep deliberating and working on it and developing better tools. Um, but there is really interesting work in progress. And if that's something that any of you here would like to talk a little bit about, I'll just say the littlest thing about it, which is um, I had a little too much faith that intuitive user-friendly technology was enough, that we could have training videos. Actually, we held Zoom training sessions twice a week for a year. Yes, and in multiple languages. Um, and many people came and we had little study halls where we'd sit down and help them map their community. So we, we did a lot. And when I, so when I say trust the technology, I also mean trust, but assist, right? Um, but what one thing I learned, one small example of a lesson learned is that no matter how much support of that kind you have, I don't think it replaces the role of like an interview dynamic. And so next time around, I would suggest training a few intake specialists to be the ones who receive and assist um, in drawing the maps and, and submitting them along. I'll, I'll mention that the Utah Commission did something that I thought was very 
useful, which was uh, have the public draw a lot of maps. I think uh, if, if I remember right, there were uh, 800 that were submitted through, I think it was an Esri tool to the, to the Utah Commission. But then the commission staff sorted them into thumbs up, this is responsive to our definition of community, thumbs sideways, I'm not sure, and thumbs down, this is not responsive. And then my lab was able to aggregate the yeses. Do you see what I mean by that? Uh, whereas in Michigan, the commission was really adamant that nothing could be discarded because that was censorship. You know, there was a, just a different dynamic. So thinking about these questions, having an intake team that, that guides submissions to be responsive so you don't have to simply sort them afterwards, with a thumbs up or thumbs down. I, I have various ideas and would love to be in conversation with all of you about ways to improve that, that process for next time. Um, I'm so glad you plugged that because I've been thinking that hearing that same observ you know, same observation made like, great, we finally had all this public input. Like now what do we do? And I was like, oh, wait, I think we do have some good examples of how to how to synthesize that and how to work with that data. But um for some of you, this will be a little repetitive, but I spend an inordinate amount of my time thinking about precinct boundaries and how to get them. Um, and this is not only critical data for redistricting, but also voter education, get out the vote work, election protection. So this is a really critical data set that um, unfortunately is just um, a super big challenge to obtain. Um, and unfortunately, it's sort of a never ending problem. Um, you know, we uh, have been working on trying to get as much data as we can from the 2022 elections. So we got a number of states last year, we'll continue to work on that this year. Um, but then it's going to be the 2024 elections. And so, um, you know, it's on to the on to the next. So figuring out how to do this in a sustainable way, because the, the problem for those of you who, who don't know, is that precinct boundaries are maintained uh, by county and county equivalents in most cases. Um, and so, you know, as one example, we worked with a phenomenal group of volunteers in Ohio, which has 88 counties. I know a lot more about how many counties each state has than I did before this job. Uh, contacted all 88 counties to collect their maps. Um, you know, sometimes you have communication problems, even just telling people like what you're trying to get. Uh, these maps are not always high quality. Um, some counties just don't have a lot of resources. So you've got like grainy PDFs that with really thick boundary lines on them or, you know, like, oh, we just have a map in our office and I just use a colored crayon basically to, to draw it there. Like, do you want us to take a picture? I'm like, sure, um, we'll do that. So you know, creating these statewide boundary files is just, uh, um, I can't emphasize enough how much work goes goes into those and how useful they are in so many contexts. So, um, you know, we continue to think about it and talk about it and figure out ways to, to make it sustainable. But um, one bright spot in all of this is um, the folks that have been working on pushing for state voting rights acts. Um, so Connecticut, um, uh, New York, uh, for example, Maryland, New Jersey, uh, Michigan, possibly. So um, there are places that are considering legislation or have recently passed legislation. And if you want to have a Voting Rights Act in your state and enforce it, then you have to have the data to do so. And that includes precinct boundaries. So, um, you know, I, th I think that that work is really important, um, of course, for <laughs> defending Voting Rights Act, but also just for making that data available publicly in one spot um, when so many people use it. And, you know, I think too, the last thing I'll plug is just, we hear a lot about um, county election officials and how much turnover there is and how many requests they get. And so that's an angle I've been trying to figure out how to work. Like, okay, we can maybe sell this as like one fewer request, you know, 10 fewer requests, uh, you know, from people for this data, if you just share it because you all need it at the state level anyway. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's a big problem that still remains to be solved. Got to say that's a great suggestion. Sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just want to jump on to agree <laughs> because that where the precincts question is the least sexy and most important question in this space. It's a great. It's absurd how, you know, I'll talk to people about language around redistricting reform that might make its way into legislation. And they want to hear about metrics of partisan gerrymandering and they want to hear about tests for VRA compliance. And then I'm like, 
how about data transparency for precinct boundaries and they fall asleep in front of me right so it's it's excruciating um also if if any of you is in a position to maybe slip a like benign line or two into some uncontroversial legislation in your in your state i cannot tell you how much of a difference it would make so new jersey's and someone's here from new jersey right new jersey's a great example it's i think one of the only states that has a really good um, precinct boundary data transparency provision in law. And what that means, it's, it's, uh, it's some more work for election administrators, but marginal because they also have to turn over certain information at the time of every election. So if that included just some GIS, where are your precincts at the time of election, it, the, the folks who are in the data trenches, it, it would save us this like enormous amount of unglamorous work you know, I did a lot of work assisting the Shadow Commission in Wisconsin this, this time, the People's Maps Commission. And then the court case didn't go the way we hoped. Uh, you know, some, some maps came out and then folks from that coalition came and said, well, how, how did the new maps do after the, after the 2022 election? I was like, I don't know, where are the precincts? You can't even analyze um, how maps did after the fact um, in, the, in some of the ways that are current in the data science analysis of elections if you don't know where the votes were, right? So this it's this arcane issue that's just huge for all the behind the scenes analysis. Um, speaking of other issues, um, something that we are hearing about in general is people worried about potential negative effects of things like artificial intelligence, AI, and of course in our space, uh, effects of misinformation um, pertaining to data or, or anything. Um, what would um, you all say are some of the strategies that future redistricting commissions um, may need to put in place to safeguard processes or address these concerns? <laughs> Lou, okay. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, this is a really hard question because AI is evolving super fast and predictions are hard and they're really hard seven years out. So um, nobody, uh, nobody quote me on this, but um, honestly, the things that come to mind are sort of already concerns and, and problems in the community. Um, one of them, of course, is um, there are a lot of folks that do, you know, automated redistricting. Um, I think there's um, really interesting value in there, but ultimately it needs to be something that people and community uh, drive the process for. So um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing AI, you know, drawing maps and people promoting those. Um, but I think it has a lot of the same problems that, you know, currently automated redistricting has. Um, and then again, the other thing that jumps to mind is, you know, sort of flooding commissioners with false testimony, which again, is already a problem, you know, it's more so coming from, uh, you know, proxies for politicians, but sort of figuring out like, who is this person? And is this testimony real and authentic um, is already a challenging we're facing and it just will probably be more of the same. So um, I wish that I had solutions for those things. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, maybe there needs to be some sort of yeah, verification process, right? Like, I don't know, um, you know, because you don't want to dissuade people from giving testimony. You don't want to make it harder than it already is, but, um, you know, having folks basically, right? Like it's nice when people show up and, and give testimony in person, or you can see them on zoom, right? Like you can, you have that body language, you have, um, just, uh, you know, all the elements that you don't get from something that's written, um, so, um, yeah, so I, I don't have good solutions. Maybe Robert does. <laughs> Robert was up here, he would. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was fair. um I, I would say, um, we need to, we need, <laughs> I think we, we just need to put some serious controls around what this is. I mean, we need to start, we need to be proactive about all, all things AI when it comes to government. I mean, you're making me think about, you talked about testimony and when people call into, you know, I, I actually got, um, I had my AI son call me from the police station and um, I, I literally thought it was my son, but it was a voice over AI. And then he gave the phone to a public defender 
right? And then I I, I was one of those scams. And, I, you know, I literally had to call one, one of my public defender friends to see if this, this person was actually a registered public defender, right? I mean, that's how, uh, yeah, I said, I got scammed like that. I was tricked. So, you know, I'm thinking about, like, when you're talking about AI, you're talking about how, you know, how malicious the uses can be. You're thinking about redistricting. You said drawing maps. I mean, we got to think about what can, I would love to hear from, from the data people. Can, can we be proactive about what that looks like? And how, how can you um, build in some controls to say, okay, this map was created by AI, right? And then we're not going to use it. Or, um, you know, we need to have some rules and laws that say we need to be very transparent about how this map was created, right? But we got we to gotta get ahead of that as government. Um, yeah, so I would say, so I'm a, I'm a practitioner of AI as well as a critic, right? Um, and so I'm not totally sure what you mean by automated redistricting, but one of, the, one of the powerful techniques that's emerged in the last few years for understanding redistricting plans is what I would call algorithmic generation of a whole pile of alternative plans made with particular priorities. And you can dial up this priority, dial down that priority get a batch of comparator plans and see how yours compares to those. So that technique generally is sometimes goes by the name ensemble analysis. So some of you will have heard of that. And um, that's a major research area of mine. And I think it's led to some actual breakthroughs, including the absolutely shocking to me fact that now all nine sitting justices on the Supreme Court have endorsed the use of uh, algorithmic district generation methods to provide evidence that helps them understand district all nine I mean uh, it's it's I never would have believed that from a court that barely knows what a standard deviation is um, <laughs> to be like it, falling in love with graph algorithms for for you know uh, district generation so now that's is that AI well in a sense it uses Markov chains this is what people would have called AI before AI meant chatbots Right, um, and so there are ways that we can be using machine learning and sort of new technologies for better understanding, for better illuminating these problems. We don't just need to be scared of it. Um, having said that, I mean, to your point, Andrew, it raises really interesting questions. Um, what do we think about maps that come out of a computer? Um, are, sh are those ever worth considering for adoption um, or are they to be used strictly as comparators? Uh, courts have disagreed in North Carolina, um, in 2019, uh, a court ordered the state to select from some computer-generated alternatives. Oh. Yep, uh, I, I wasn't, a, I was not wild about that moment. Um, but you know, courts have taken different attitudes to the relevance of of these kinds of, of maps. So, so you know, I completely agree with you. Also, that um, another interesting place to think about artificial intelligence is in the trying to understand. I mean, AstroTurf is going to get much more sophisticated with, with chatbots, and we saw that happen in some of the states that we worked in. But the other thing to say is, in my lab, we spent so much time um, trying to summarize public testimony, and that's actually something chatbots can do really well, mm. right? It, you can give that chatbot a thousand pages of testimony and say, pull out themes, right? So I just want to say, I, you, usually people like to say, AI that people think it's going to be helpful, but it's going to also be damaging in all these ways. And I guess partly I'm here to say, we all think it's going to be damaging, but it's also going to be helpful in all these ways. I want to make sure we have um, some time for questions from the audience. Um, would anybody like to ask any of our panelists a question? One over here, and we're going to get you a mic. It'll go on. It just takes a minute. <laughs> Sarah, um, you're taking Moon with you to the breakout session, right? Because you're both doing data. So, <laughs> all right. I saw some hands over here. It's all a maze to get around. So, I have a woman first. <laughs> Ta da. Um, this is a question for, you know, um, neophytes here. What is AstroTurf, please? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so in a football stadium, AstroTurf is plastic fake grass. And in the context of public input, it's fake grass roots. That's why it's called that, right? Oh, <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, what looks like grass roots. It could have been letters to the editor or submissions to 
a, a commission or uh, some other body, but fake grassroots is when it's generated by a campaign. So let me just, or, or by a computer. Um, so let me just give you a tiny example. Um, when we were um, trying to understand the Michigan uh, testimony that we received through the public portal, my team noticed just on our own, we were like, you know, we're getting a whole lot of mapped areas south of Ann Arbor where people are saying a lot of the same things. And then we organized ourselves and counted them up and there were more than 150 um, with very similar maps and very similar keywords. And we were like, I wonder if there's a, a campaign there. And then we just lucked into finding on Facebook a sitting representative who had asked people who like said, map my district and here's some things to say about why it's your community, oh. right? So we basically had 150 copies of a district. <laughs> um, and so that was just luck to actually find evidence of the source of all the repetition. Um, but even without that, it was something kind of seemed like there was a pattern. Um, and, and so an interesting little side note to that story is, okay, so 150 people all took marching orders from one person. Does that make the testimony illegitimate? I'm not sure, right? Um, we all think that it is, I think probably I'm gonna speak for much of the room. We probably all think it's legitimate for a group with good faith intentions to go out and organize people around particular themes. Um, it just feels a little wrong for a sitting representative to do that, to disguise their own district as a community. But the line there is no, there is no bright line there um, between legitimate and illegitimate. And I, I do think that it will become harder to detect, um, but it was already hard to detect and hard to know what to do with once you detected uh, this kind of astroturfing. Thank you for asking. All right, we've got a question back here. I, I, something that I was curious about was just to hear if there have been any models um, either that you are leading or others in terms of like building the capacity, the data capacity, like at least for me, I'm interested in like grassroots organizations, you know, for the next cycle, you know, we would love to see more community groups actually have the capacity of, you know, developing maps, using GIS, like all of these different data software things that, you know, only folks that go to like academia, like may have access to, but how do we make that accessible and how do we create cohorts of groups within those community groups you know so that they're ready for the next cycle to actually help kind of lead that those efforts or the the data side of the work that happens on the ground i'll just call out one person do, do you all know fred mcbride he's the best um fred's worked for lots of different orgs in the space i think these days he's at southern poverty law center um but he did he did an amazing project where he went, he made his own road show and went around mostly to HBCUs, but not only, um, visiting schools and doing participatory mapping training. Um, yeah, and so that's one example, but I actually like, let's talk, cause I could put you in touch with lots of people who are doing different kinds of training efforts and are doing beautiful things. But I just wanted to call out Fred, who's a hero in the space. Anyone else that? No, and I'm going to reach out to Fred to help us with our regional leadership academy uh, process because that's exactly what we're trying to do with this initiative, the data access and equity initiative for for cohorts of, of community folks who are part of different groups to be able to be ready when these opportunities come out. But that's a specific module that could be right within this is, is uh, what what'd you call it? I forgot what you, what'd you call it. His training, training yeah. session. I think it was, uh, I'll look up the exact yeah. name so I don't bungle it. <laughs> but exactly. Yeah, and uh, not to belabor the point here, but yeah, I mean, training is the key, but, um, you know, any training program, you want to ultimately teach people to fish for themselves, right, so that they can train others and, um, you know, scale up, and um, so, you know, certainly that's something that we've offered, we'll help, you know, training on data, we'll training on mapping tools, um, but more importantly is making that all available online so that people can use that down the road. Um, that being said, I think there's a couple of communication gaps that are still happening. I mentioned one earlier about students and connecting them with some of this work. Um, I think that we've learned this last couple months that there's 
um, you know, still a lot of folks out there that want this kind of training and there are groups that are offering it. Um, and so just like, how do we connect these people? You know, like, <laughs> like tell me who these groups are, right? Tell, tell all of us who these groups are so that we can connect them with the resources that are already out there or put something together for them that if it doesn't already exist, you know, um, and then make that more widely available for others. So, um, yeah. Uh, Norman Turrell from Oregon. I wanted to go back to the idea of using AI or any computers in generative uh, redistricting. And this question comes up a lot in my advocacy, just because this is on the mind of a lot of citizens. And my answer is that uh, using AI usually requires thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of examples of uh, good examples of something that you're trying to generate. And in redistricting, we really only have a handful of good examples of well done uh, redistricting. And so AI really can't be used uh, for generative uh, redistricting maps. And, and computers are just not powerful enough, in fact, to do the kind of work that they think that it can do. Maybe we can have uh, equal districts and uh, I don't know, districts that don't cross boundaries, but when you get in more and more criteria, computers just can't handle the, the generative. And I wanted to I'm see if there's any response. gently contest that <laughs> um, and say that I think actually there've been huge breakthroughs in getting uh, powerful generative models that take the relevant criteria into account. Um, and your work with thousands of uh, examples. Uh, yes, yeah, so what you're thinking of, I believe, is a kind of machine learning notion where you have a training set uh, and then you train on that data and build, uh, it, uh, you generate from there. Um, but a lot of what's happening in the field is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Markov chain based where you only need one starting point. I'd love to talk to you more about this. This is my happy place. Um, probably not maybe a whole room conversation, but I, I just do think it's, it's good just as education for everyone that there are a, a lot of folks building these generative models of districts for community serving purposes. Uh, Stephanie Somersell, I'm going to call out one of my colleagues here in the audience, just did an ensemble analysis for Montana's energy districts. I mean, these are things that, that folks are doing to try to help us understand how to put a districting plan in the context of other alternatives. And I think the methods really are pretty holistic and powerful at this point. We can build, just to give you a sense of speed, we can build a million plans in eight seconds. Um, and that shouldn't impress you because there's so many possibilities out there, but we can do it in a way that's like building a representative sample of what could have been possible under various frameworks of rules. So I think that's really come really far. I'd love to have that conversation Let's because I'm a computer scientist and mathematician. We do indeed. Oh, I was gonna, yeah. So, um, and Moon, I'd actually like you to respond and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because um, I, yeah, definitely the power of these algorithms is great. And I love the ensemble techniques that are being used in court. I think it's really phenomenal to be like, yep, that's an outlier. Like <laughs> we just drew, you know, however many million maps and never once did we draw anything that remotely resembles like the, the map that the, you know, legislature or whoever drew. But um, certainly one hesitation I've heard, and, and I'd like you to weigh in if, you, if you'd care to, um, is just around implementing the Voting Rights Act um, in these methods. Just And I think some of the complications come around that there aren't these bright lines around the Voting Rights Act of like, you need X percent, you know, and this is the data that you're using. But, um, but I'd love to hear if there's been work done in the space or advances. Sure. Well, as it happens, I, I didn't plant that but I have a paper on that <laughs> that's called Computational Redistricting and the Voting Rights Act came out in the Election Law Journal in 2021. Um, but just to say the Voting Rights Act is a really hard, messy corner of the law when it comes to redistricting, but it's not impossible to do a good job. <laughs> um, and uh, conversation to be continued later, but I will say this, um, there are a lot of myths about the Voting Rights Act, such as that it requires you to hit certain demographic percentages. Um, and it's really hard to actually, not only is it really hard to unpack what the current case law requires, but it changes every week. It feels like when a new judge comes along with a brand new interpretation. So the October, late October 
decision in Georgia, which was favorable to Voting Rights Act plaintiffs, also created a crazy new standard within the same decision. So it's a moving target, um, but one that we're, we're up to the challenge because we think that um, you know broad representation and the spirit of the Voting Rights Act is so important. I think that's a great point to end on. And I'm gonna um, ask everyone to please give a big thanks to our panelists and-